We already know that by using functions, we can easily model pure computations. In this video, we'll learn about a new structure that will help us model synchronous computations with side effects. If you are here and have followed my course so far, you already know the importance of functions, especially pure functions. As you know, I like to think of functions as pipes. They receive one input from one side and return an output from the other side. Pure functions are simply mappings from input values to output values. For that to happen, we should put some limitations on these functions. Maybe assumptions is a better word. If this looks new to you, please check out my video on functions in this course. These assumptions make pure functions easy to compose and combine to create new pure functions. And this ease of composition of functions to create complex solutions from simple ones is the main goal and promise of functional paradigm. We can continuously compose pure functions to reach our desired solution. And since these functions don't affect each other's behavior, we can move them around and use them in different contexts. We can test them easily, reason about them faster. There will be no surprises and we are always in control. But in order for us to create useful applications, our functions should be able to reach outside and thus side effects. But as soon as they do that, they get implicitly dependent on the context they're being called in and cannot be composed with other functions reliably. Consider a function that wants to write to a terminal. Let's call this function increment and log. This function receives a number as an input, increments and logs it to a terminal, and finally returns the incremented number. This function is obviously not pure, since it's affecting the environment outside of its body. However, the benefits of pure functions are so great that we always want to have them, because we believe in how easy they are to combine and compose. But this is not the first time we encounter side effects. We've already solved this when our functions needed to throw errors and exceptions. Let's consider parse date function. Parse date receives a string, parses it, and returns a date object. In case we provide a non-date string to this function, it throws an error. If you think about it, this throwing is kind of a side effect. The caller of parse date needs to know that this function should be called in a try-catch block if it wants to capture this error and side effect. The way we solved this was by redesigning our function and enhancing its return type. Now either structure not only represents date, it can also represent the error type which here is a string. Can we use this idea of enhancing function's return type for modeling any kind of side effect? For example, how can we make increment and log function pure, but also being able to specify we want to write something to the terminal when we get to this point of our application? Can we extract and push this side effect to our return type? In order to do that, what does the return type look like? How about uh, another small function with no inputs? That way we can extract the side effect part of increment and log function into our new small function. This makes increment and log pure, because every time it is being called, it returns the same function without actually doing any side effects. These kind of functions with no inputs are called punks. Punks cannot be pure unless they return a same value every time, like a constant. They are not much useful unless they do side effects. So how about reserve these thunks for modeling side effects? What we did is we came up with a new structure specifically to handle side effects. Let's name our new structure IO. Now our increment and log function receives a number and returns an I.O. of a number. 
IO of A is a structure that when it is invoked, it delivers us some value of type A. What IO gives us is the opportunity to postpone and delay side effects to a later time, allowing us to benefit from the advantages of function purity. Just to see some code, if our incremental lock function looked like this, and we want to rewrite it using IO to make it pure, it would look something like this. Well, you might say, although we made our incremental lock function pure, but I'm not completely confident that I can design my applications using I.O. It feels not easy to compose functions when we're dealing with I.O. Let's look at an example. Let's say we have a download function that receives a URL and returns an I.O. of a string. We have another function is JSON that receives a string and returns a boolean. What we want is to compose these two functions so we can check if the downloaded string from a URL is a JSON or not. For the sake of this video, let's assume our download function is synchronous. But the output of the download function does not match the input of its JSON function. So how can we compose this? The same way as we did with option, list, and either structures. If IO is functor, then we can lift our isJSON function to our IO context. If this looks new to you, I have a dedicated video on functors in this course that I went through and explained functors in details. Now that the types are compatible, we can compose these two pure functions reliably. The result of this composition is another pure function that returns an IO of a boolean. Since the result itself is a pure function, we can continuously compose it with other functions to create new pure functions until we have our application as a big pure function. Well, map function is one way to lift functions to IO context. Based on our function input and output types, there are other ways to lift and prepare our functions for composition. We will learn about them as we progress through the course. But the main idea here is, if we can compose functions that return I.O. with other functions, hopefully we can push and delay our side effects all the way to the edge of our application. This allows us to write our application logic without executing any side effects until we are ready to do so. Next, let's check if I.O. is indeed a functor. If I.O. is functor, then we have a map function that can convert IO of A to IO of B, just by knowing a function from A to B. Let's expand the IO definition. If you remember in the covariant and contravariant video, we've already looked at function structure and we saw function is a covariant functor on its return type. But let's look at it from IO perspective again. If we name our IO of A function, G, we can compose G and F like this, which results in a function from nothing to B. And this function is exactly what we were looking for. IO of B is a function from nothing to B. Writing the definition of map function, it receives function F. It then returns a new function that receives function G and returns the composition of F and G as the result. So, we could come up with a map function that receives a function from A to B and lifts that to a function from IO of A to IO of B. In other words, IO is a functor and more precisely, a covariant functor. Something to realize is, IO doesn't error out. It always delivers us a value of type A. If we want to model errors as part of the IO, we need to use either. Now our I.O. is delivering an either of E and A. Similar to composing functions, can we compose our structures I.O. and either? From the functor composition video, we know since I.O. and either are both functors, we can compose them and the new structure which we are calling it I.O. either 
is also a functor. As a reminder, the map function for IO either functor is the composition of the map functions of IO and either. Let's summarize. IO provides us with means to handle side effects in our applications. It does that by encapsulating side effects in the tongue functions, effectively delaying them. Do not think of IO as a function, but as a structure that holds data. And with tools like Functor, we can build and compose our application without running any side effects until we're ready to do so. IO doesn't error out and always delivers us the type it holds. We can use either structure if we need to model errors in IO. Something to notice, and I will cover it in next videos, is IO is synchronous by itself. But most side effects we know, like fetching from the internet or writing to a database, are asynchronous. How can we model asynchronous side effects? We can use Promise with I.O. to bring asynchronous support to I.O. This structure is so useful that we have a special name for it. It is called Task. But more on that later. And with that, thank you for watching this video. Please like and subscribe, and I will see you in the next one.